Good morning, and thank you for listening to WXOX 97.1 FM in Louisville, Kentucky. This is Artist Talk with LVA, and I'm your host, Keith Waits. Uh, today, we have an old friend of the program, um, and, and he's here to talk about the exhibition Over the Moon, The Eclectic Art of Anne Farnsley. It showcases the life and art of the Vive Indiana artist. It was first at the Community Arts Center of Switzerland County, and it is now at the Carnegie Center for Art and History in New Albany through January the 7th of the coming year. Uh, our, my guest is John Bagley, a freelance art worker. Uh, he was previously the gallery director and assistant professor of art and the critical curatorial studies graduate program coordinator at the Eleanor Height Art Institute of the University of Louisville. Before that, he was the director of the Louisville Visual Art Association from 1983 to 2001. And before that, he was the director of the New Harmony Gallery of Contemporary Art from 1975 to 1983. But he's here now to talk about uh, Anne Farnsley and this exhibit about her work uh, that, that he put together. So good morning, John. Good morning. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Always, I say old friend of the show. I don't know. It's like on SNL, the Five Timers Club. I think you're definitely like. <laughs> I want a jacket. <laughs> I don't have a jacket for you, I'm afraid. But there's a few of you who've been on a few times. Um, uh, Andy Cousins is another one. Some, someday, I, maybe I'll do a little, maybe I'll make a little compilation show sometime of the, of the friends of the show uh guests that have been on so many times but uh well i feel uh lucky to have been on it's it's a great show well thank you um so i'm assuming i haven't asked you to you must have known ann farnsley yourself well um not really i when i was in new harmony uh one weekend uh, we got out of town and we drove up along the river and ended up uh, in going through Vive. And there was a, at that time, there was the Ogle House Inn, which was, had recently been built. And it's, was, you know, it's now um, sort of, <laughs> it's not functioning because they built Belterra and the casino just, yeah. just uh, further up close to Vive, but up near Markland Dam. Yeah. And, uh, so the Ogle House closed, but the Ogle House was uh, Paul Ogle and the Ogle Foundation that moved to New Albany. So um, anyway, at that time, this was in the 70s, mid uh, 77, 78, sometime like that. And Anne had her gallery, her own gallery there. And we went in and I was interested because Vivi and New Harmony are sort of, you know, Indiana, Southern Indiana river towns that uh, were somehow had art galleries in them. <laughs> so I thought it was pretty neat to find another, um, but basically it was just, I introduced myself, she introduced herself. I looked her around and, and never went further. I always intended to go back and talk more, but somehow never got there, so. I really didn't know her well. Were you familiar with the work over the years? Well, I'd, I had seen uh, work from time to time, um, but I, I didn't realize the full extent of her work or her career until I got involved in this project. Well, talk a little bit about that. I've seen some, some of the images and uh, it's interesting. I don't know how how would you characterize her as a as as a painter? And I know she did some uh, sculptural work too. So how would you characterize her work? Well, um, she she definitely was trained um, in modernist uh, mm -hmm. work. She she went to University of Louisville, finished her undergraduate degree at U of L. She'd been at Cornell, but came back. Her family, of course, is from here. The Farnsley Mormon is part of uh, her family. Right. And Charlie Farnsley the, was the mayor, was her right. dad. So she had, um, you know, pretty deep Louisville connections. But um, she, in 70, she moved to Vivi um, and she'd graduated from U of L in 68 with a master's. So um, in creative arts, they, that was the degree in the master's program at that time. 
Um, Sally Drummond was had the same degree. Um, and anyway, um, she was married to Ron Gascoigne at the time and they divorced. And when they divorced, she moved to Vivi. She left Louisville behind and never moved back. So she spent the rest of her career in Vivi, Indiana. Um, and she showed up and down the river, including the Portland Museum um, in 86 after I was you know, at the water tower. Um, and she was deeply influenced by um, children and children's art and the simplicity of it. I, and I guess it's almost like she was a magic realist. I mean, she developed this sort of cosmology of symbols that she employed. It was, was not at all like what she was doing when she graduated uh, in 68, which was much more sort of related to abstract expressionism and sort of non-objective uh, abstraction. But she moved away from that pretty quickly and into these things that she called spacescapes, um, which, you know, the over the moon title <laughs> relates to going out past the moon into space. So, so that was the, the, the thing I, I found out about um, her as I delved deep and looked at more of her work. Well, when I when I look at the imagery, it seems it seems like you know at a, at first glance it does seem sort of naive or almost almost like a folk artist. But then the more you look at it, the more you realize that there is a very sophisticated sensibility and a very sophisticated sort of um, sense of composition going on. Yes, it, exactly. It's uh, you know I think Picasso said something about he'd spent his life learning to make art and. And then he spent his training learning to make out and the rest of his life learning how to paint like a child, you know? So in some ways that she's parallel to that. She was looking at Chagall. She was looking at Matisse. Uh, she was looking at Kandinsky uh, at, at, in her studies. And of course at U of L at that time there was you know, the, the influence of Olfert Wilkie and um, the other German uh, expats that were teaching at U of L um, would have brought her clearly aware of all that. And she worked in the art library at, at uh, Cornell. So her academic training um, sort of indicates that she, she chose to do what she was doing in terms of the simplicity and the whimsy and the things that she put into her work. I think it also had to do with living in Vivi because she wanted to make art um, and, and her audience, she, ne she knew that she needed her audience to respond to what she was doing. So, maybe not objective abstraction wasn't the way to go. <laughs> she had the sense to, to, to think about. And, and there's a quote, one of the interesting things about um, doing the show is that, um, you know, her, her Facebook account was still there. We could look back and see what, what she was doing and who she was looking at on Facebook and things like that, which is a pretty good record. Her, her computer files were still there, including her to-do notes. Um, and so you could see sort of daily priorities of uh, what she was engaged in. Well, and we should say she just passed away in uh, 2021, correct? Correct. So correct. it's very recent. Um, and so when you when you talk about those resources, they're they're fairly current, right? And you know the the thing that uh, attracted me to the project was one that that spending fifty plus years in a small town as an artist, mm -hmm. uh, I've I've always 
uh, been interested in how you make, how you live a life in art in a place that's not an art capital. You right. know, how you keep up with what you're doing, um, what's, do, what's going on in the world, but how you also live with the people around you who are, you know, run the pharmacy or the barbershop or the, all those things that are, make up a small community. And, um, you know, she was successful at doing that. Well, and I was thinking as you were talking, I was thinking that very thing about what, how does Vive shape her and shape the art? And I think you've, you've kind of answered that. But yeah, it's like, um, so I'm, I'm guessing there must have been a lot of subscriptions to Art in America and things like that. And then the, then the internet maybe comes in and kind of becomes a, the, the connection for her to, to what's happening in the outside world. I, I think she was also uh, really gregarious. Mm -hmm. uh, and she made a lot of friends. And, and when she died, this, this project came about because her friend said, we've got to do something. Yeah. I mean, the impetus for the show at the Community Arts Center came from the people that knew her, that collected her work, that supported her. Um, and I got involved um, after that committee had formed to do something. So, so you know, that, that's a great testimony and most of the work in the show comes from, I mean, U of L owned a piece, the Filson owns a piece, uh, but she's not in a lot of uh, collections, museum collections right. or things like that. She never had a, she showed in Louisville, um, but really didn't have a single uh, Louisville gallery to promote her work here. Um, so all this work came back and we looked at, we put out a call again using the internet and her website and a new website we formed um, and word of mouth in a small town, you know, word of mouth's pretty strong. Yeah. <laughs> and um, everybody knows each other. With over 300 pieces to choose from. Wow. So, so it was out there and that was, and we keep finding more. I mean, people are still, um, C.J. Parrish was um, a good friend of hers and actually worked in Louisville, but she was the editor. She went to VB to be the editor of the paper and uh, became a lifelong friend. And so she's good at, um, you know, keeping the, uh, the website active and things like that. And she keeps having people contact her about, well, I have some of Anne's work. And after the show is already formed, you know, people come up to me and say, well, did you talk to so-and-so? He's got a lot of the work. You should go up there and see that. And I said, well, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe a book someday. <laughs> you, yeah. you, you can Although get all... we did a nice catalog. Yeah. But they raised the money to um, produce, you know, a synopsis of her career and gave me the privilege of writing that. Um, and I, I deeply appreciate that because it was a chance to really focus my thoughts as I was working through looking at the work. Well, that's, and that's getting to be a rare thing too. Uh, you know, it, se it seems like there was a time when a catalog was a very common thing. And it seems like unless, unless you're in one of the, the sort of higher profile, extremely well-funded museums, you don't see monographs or catalogs uh, done quite as much in, in regional areas like this. So. Yeah, I think it's really important um, because th then it, you know, the, an exhibition is sort of an ephemeral thing. Mm -hmm. you know, here today and gone to more tomorrow, just like little bunny foo foo. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but but a catalog will hang around in the library for a long time. Right. And and you know, one of the things that. I think it's really nice about the catalog we did is we we did the exhibition checklist with an image for each ex, for each piece and who owned the piece when when this show was done. So so if somebody comes along later, they'll have some indication of where to start finding work if they want to do something else. And that, that's a really hard thing. I mean. Um, 
when I was at U of L, we would have people writing to us and asking about, do you have a, an exhibition checklist? Was this piece shown at that show that you did, et cetera? So keeping those records is an important part of the infrastructure of an art community. Right. Well, you say the ephemerality of the exhibit, which is sort of what makes it special for the people who experience it. You know, I, I was able to be there and share in that. But then, but then you're right, then 10 years later, um, it doesn't have as much impact. Do you, do you think, I mean, so this show has been in these two locations, the one in, uh, in the Switzerland County, which is Vive, correct? Right. And now here at Carnegie, is, is there any possibility that it has a life beyond this, this particular time frame? Actually, we've been contacted by a couple other places downstate that are that are sort of interested in the show the the one difficulty is since it's borrowed from yeah. individuals um a lot of it some of it was in her estate when she died and some of it belongs to family so there's a core there that could be e easily reassembled but you know there's already people saying well i loaned you this in september and i don't get it back till january you know so <laughs> into my yeah wall is empty without my Ann Farnsley. So, so, you know, that I don't think this exact same show is possible again, but. But as you say, you made all these, you've, you've been hearing all this information and tips on other artwork. Right, right. So right. it could be possible to. Exactly, exactly. Um, and of course, we've got to capture that. That's, that's, um, part of the thing that this committee and us will have to do is is make sure we got good notes about what we didn't get yeah. um, and and somehow get that archived interestingly enough um vivi has the historical society and she was active that one of the things that um i think the the loyalty to her in the community is um, she did cartoons for the paper. She did these things called munchies. And, and um, the munchies were always having these uh, discussions and they were sort of editorial kinds of things or things yeah. going on in the community of, of the weekly paper. Um, but she also did, when she moved there in, in the 70s, by 74, 75, she was trying to get Vivi on the National Register of Historic Places because it was uh, settled in 1802. It was one of the first communities in Indiana before the state. Um, and it was a, you know, a Swiss immigrant group that settled the place because they thought they could grow, the, you know, the, the hills there that back up to Vivi are much like the Moselle or the Rhine River um, places in Germany and, and uh, France and Switzerland that grew wine. And so they were, they thought it was, they could make a go at it selling wine. And they did for a while, but I guess the blight got them in it because it only recently they've started regrowing vineyards in, in uh, around the area there. But anyway, she, it, it, it got on the National Register in 2019. So she stuck with pushing the community and writing the grants and writing the copy and documenting the historic houses in these very wonderful little uh, line drawings, not at all like her space gates. Um, they're in the show and they're documents of this, um, the historic homes and buildings in Vivi. And then she was also um, got involved in ceramics and apprenticed herself at Hadley Pottery for like a period of time to learn how to paint ceramics, which she then went back to Vivi and started making jars and plates and things like that. She even did a set of dinnerware for lilies. 
Um, so, so that's why the term eclectic comes into the show title because she was doing all these different things. She was, you know, the, the term for a journalist and with a military unit is embedded. Yeah. And, and I think she was an embedded artist. <laughs> so that her, her artistic identity is inextricably tied to Vive and life in Vive. Yeah, she said, there's a quote I found that said, I moved here because of the environment of nature, of being able to be next to the river. And, and she lived in a house overlooking the river. So when she would go out her back porch, it was the river view, you know, which is a pretty wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah, I could imagine not wanting to ever leave a place like that. <laughs> if if you can make a living. Yeah. And um, you know, the, the, so she she waited tables at the at the casino for a while. <laughs> she delivered papers. <laughs> she, she she gave tours. She, she convinced the DQ in, in Vivi to make a map of the historic sites of Switzerland County as the place map. And she drew this map and all the roads and all the houses at certain you know, crossroads or churches. There was a round barn in, outside of Vivi and that was on the map that you could go see. And this was the DQ, you know, this. <laughs> Are they still using that? I don't think they're, they're using that map anymore, but the tourism uh, office certainly is. And somebody tore down the round barn. So she put up, she drew in there, she drew Fred the goat. And Fred the goat was, is Vivi's, was the, the town goat. It was, it was wild. And everybody sort of took care of Fred. And, you know, Louisville has horses. Vivi's got goats sitting all around town. <laughs> Are they friendly? Yeah. Fred's gone now, too. So. But you say she was working, like she was waiting tables at the casino. Well, how old was she when she was doing that? Because the casino hasn't, how long, I'm not sure how long the casino has been there, but. She was doing that in retirement age, right? I guess probably. Well, not quite, but I mean, she was she was not a wealthy person. I mean, she she scrambled, but she did what she needed to do to yeah. live her life as an artist. I mean, it was, and she didn't separate the two. You know, I mean, what she was doing, meeting people, gathering ideas, having fun. I mean. Um, that was all part of being able to live the way she wanted to in a small town. So as you talk about all this, you know, I'm, I'm really struck by, um, I mean, you certainly have the credentials to do this professionally, but it also just sounds like you had a blast doing it. Like you have a lot of fun discovering all these things. Um, and, that it go, and, and, and also that there's very little separation between discovering her what her art was about and discovering what her life was about and i mean in fact there's there should be no separation but it, you really underscore that in the way you're talking about her so all of this was information you got once you got that you that you discovered once you got involved in the project yeah yeah exactly um the um community arts center asked me to to give a talk um about the show and I said, sure, you know, <laughs> I'm always willing to talk. <laughs> and um, then I got to thinking, well, wait a minute, who's going to be in this audience? It's people who knew Ann Farnsley. I mean, who am I to be telling them things? But, but looking at the work and what I learned about the work and how it was constructed was almost like a conversation I had with her. So I, I called the talk speaking with Anne and I'm going to do it again in, in uh, New Albany on December 
13th. I think it's a Tuesday at noontime at the Carnegie. But but if you if you look through the work and and you look through her quotes and what she's saying about the work, um, you get a real sense of her um, and and what she was about. Um, you know, the the one of the things, the reason I know about the the um, working at Belterra and, and those sorts of things is she and a friend sat down one afternoon, I think after she was ill and talked about all the jobs she had had. And it went down this list and down this list. And I mean, there was, you know, she, she was a volunteer uh, at the history uh, museum, the historical society, um, but she was a really regular volunteer. She also painted sets for the theater. Then there's a theater in VV and a local theater company. And she acted in, <laughs> she, she was a, um, what's, what's um, I'm losing the, the play, a Steel Magnolia. She was, oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, there's all these, and she had all this listed. And then the last thing she said is, and I danced at Carnegie Hall. And I thought, well, what? You know, what is this? And then I looked at the cookbook that she did. She did a Munchies cookbook. Yeah. And and it, there's her name is artist. And then chef is this Celia Ipositos. And I thought, well, that must be, since she did plates for lilies, maybe this was somebody that was that was at lilies at one time, although um, that wasn't a familiar name. Nobody seemed to know. And then, so I started looking around and I found that Celia Epizidos was a modern dancer and quite, and would have been there in the late 60s, early 70s and ran a podcast about dance in New York until 2004. Um, and she was a friend of Anne's and she, Anne got her to come and be an artist in residence in the Switzerland County Schools in, in the 80s or 90s. I don't know exactly the date of that, but see how this whole way she worked was, <laughs> you know, embedded. I mean, so she's bringing in, and, and then they produce this cookbook. It's pretty nice. It's got really interesting recipes in it. It's <laughs> and it's illustrated with these munchies. But so you're surmising that, she, that maybe that's how she danced in Carnegie Hall? Was it? Yeah, was I'm it, sure she was in one of Cecilia's right. productions because she was a dancer at that time. I mean, she wasn't running this project. I mean, the, the reviews and the what's going on in New York dance came after a while. I was so, I mean, was there, but is there any sort of documentation of that? Or is it just, all, all we've got is that quote? And then you're kind of, you're kind of building the possible narrative about that. Right. I have not talked to Celia Pazitas, but I think we could. Be well, I just wondered to fan, because I mean, like if I was, if I had anything to do with being on stage at Carnegie Hall, I would have clippings and things, you know, I would not let that stuff go. But um <laughs> <laughs> but, but but so it's interesting because I thought I thought well we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about her work as an artist which is valuable but you're really it's almost as if we're 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 sort of coming the, the her work as an artist is just a part of her impact creatively well, or in the or in no. the, you know that it's 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 extremely important but that she was doing all these other things to bring other people in and do do things in that community besides what her own work meant. Yeah, yes, you know that there's there's a genre that's appeared lately, uh, Theaster Gates, who's you know working in a neighborhood in Chicago that's bought buildings and and you know put them to use in other things besides art studios and things like that. Right. It's called social practice, right? Right. And I mean, she's practicing social practice 
from the time she moved to Vivi because she had to, you know, I mean, that's the way you could be an artist in Vivi. Well, I think a lot of people would think like, well, sure, you can do all that stuff if you're living in a big city like Louisville or Chicago or Cincinnati or, but, but the fact that she could be, I mean, she was every bit as involved as the busiest person in Louisville. It sounds like to me, you know, in Vive, where I think our assumptions would be, there just wouldn't be that many things for you to dip your toes into. Well, she might have been more involved than somebody. I mean, in Louisville, you might be able to not have to do all those things. Uh, right. And, and once, you know, and once the community finds out, well, Anne will do it, Anne will draw this, my house, you know, I mean, she, she, we found a list and we don't have many of the portrait, but she did commission portraits. And there's a list of between 50 and 60 people that she did portraits of. And there's one or two in the show, but the rest of them, you know, they're in somebody's house. It's their dad or their grandmother or, you know, I mean, and the, they weren't, thinking about loaning it or who the artist was. They just want the picture of right. their dad. And, and she did horse portraits. I mean, she loved horses. She started riding when she was a child. And horses are a huge part of her artwork. But she, and the horses, you know, her horses may have roller skates on, you know. <laughs> or they're jumping over the moon or stuff like that. Right. But, she also did horse portraits. And I found um, photographs of her photographing the hoof and the ankle joint of horses and the back flank and the chest. And, you know, I mean, she was taking her camera and, you know, really studying how a horse is put together in order to do horse portraits because you know when you want a portrait of your horse you don't want it on roller skates <laughs> maybe maybe some maybe. people do, but but we don't have a lot of those either but but that she was doing that because that was another way she could make some money uh making art um and she had no compunction about well i just have to do this I can't do anything else, you know? And some artists, that's the way they are. And that's great too, you know? They're just focused intently on one thing and they just keep doing it over till they get it right. And they keep doing it over till they get it right. She was, do this, do that, do this. We'll see if it's right or not. They'll tell me if it's right. If it's not right, I'll fix it, you know? So, I mean, it's that's the wonder of, of finding an artist is there so is there anything and I, this this is maybe uh maybe not a fair question but you know we think i mean charles charles farnsley her father of course has a, a very strong place in louisville history and in the arts community um because of so many things that got started under his administration i'm not even sure if i would correctly name them all but i believe the fund for the arts happens under his administration i think the um orchestra uh, happens in, but but well, that, the orchestra started a little earlier but the fund for the arts was one way to continue to support the orchestra right and the library system got a big i mean that that there yeah i mean it seems like you know he really stands out and he's celebrated for that that's why i know that because that's a thing in louisville uh there's that statue of him in front of the uh fund for the arts but so is there is there like a is there something in the Farnsley DNA, do you think? I mean, is, is, is this sort of like, what was she inheriting from her father? Because to me, it seems like a very strong through line from what Charlie was doing to what Anne was doing, even though there are different actions, you know, it's that sort of that sort of sense of commitment to a community and, and pushing that the, the arts and the creative side of things in the community. Um, and I'm sure as mayor, he did other things that were not about the arts, but he stands that way as the, the, pol the, the politician, the, the, the mayor in the history of the city who did the most for the arts is his sort of iconic position. Is there something about the Farnsley 
uh, legacy or the DNA in that family that sort of pushes them that way, you think? Well, um, I think she had a rich childhood that was deeply involved in the arts. And, um, but, you know, she's got um, brothers and sisters that aren't, aren't artists. They're, they went into law, into business and, and various other activities for their careers. Um, so, you know, I think they were active thinking, working people that uh, pursued what they want. Uh, one of the things that I find interesting is in some ways she left the Louisville connection um, and went to Vivi. So, so in some ways she wanted to sort of establish her own uh, place. Um, and not that she ever quit being part of the family because everybody in the family liked to come to Vivi. Her, her, the reason they got to Vivi in the first place is her folks bought a second home there. And so they had, she'd already been to Vivi before she decided to move there. Right. Uh, so, and, you know, again, Vivi, um, there's, there's a number of other artists that have been in Vivi. Will Henry Stevens, which is a pretty well-known modernist taught at Tulane who worked in Asheville and, and um, is known for his artwork. The, the family actually bought a house that he lived in there. And there's a wonderful printmaker there named August Mead. And there's um, the Hoosier Schoolmaster, that book is the uh, author from Vivi Eggleston. And the, the first singing cowboy, Ken Maynard, is from <laughs> Vivi. So, I mean, so maybe it's in the water and Vivi. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's not, and maybe it's the Farnsley genetics and the Vivi water and all of it. I, you know, it's, it's fascinating to speculate about how this occurred but it's also great to just celebrate it. Right. Well, John, um, we're, we're just about out of time. Um, I want to thank you so much for, for, for taking the time to talk about all this. It's very enlightening to me. And again, I just, I, it, I really get a sense of um, the fun you have on a project like this. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I can take on one or two projects a year now that I don't have to do 20 and uh, right. That's a joy. And sort of immerse yourself yeah. in it. And then, yeah. So uh, so once again, what we've been talking about is uh, the exhibition Over the Moon, the Eclectic Art of Anne Farnsley, uh, which showcases the life, of, as you've been listening, of this woman who, from Louisville, moved to Vive in, in, in Indiana and spent all the rest of her life there. Uh, the exhibit is available for viewing right now at the Carnegie Center for Art and History in New Albany through January the 7th of 2023. And John, you're doing that talk. You said, what was it? December, was it December 13th? 13th at yeah. noon. It's a Tuesday at yeah. Carnegie Center. So if people, if people found this at all interesting, there will be more uh, uh, that you can uh, glean from John's experience exploring Anne Farnsley on at that talk. All right. Well, thank you so much, John. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.